The following podcast is brought to you by fantasy-animation.org, an online platform dedicated to the academic discussion of fantasy storytelling and the medium of animation. To access previous episodes of the podcast and to check out our blog, do visit the website fantasy-animation.org as well as following us on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook at fananimresearch, F-A-N-A-N-I-M research. These episodes are recorded remotely at the moment given the ongoing situation, so do forgive any audio blips and blemishes. For now, do enjoy the show. Parce qu'on m'a dit, si tu retournes, je sais pas, ceci et cela vont arriver. Allez. Allez. Hello, avid listeners and fantasy animation fans, and welcome to this latest episode of the Fantasy Animation Podcast with me, your comic book adaptation, Chris Holiday, And me with my identity confused but still witty, Alex Sargent. Great. Uh, so for this instalment, we've turned to you um, and we've been going through your suggestions we've received for possible episodes based on a broader theme of diversity and inclusion. Now, we asked you for your recommendations based off of one of our previous blog posts, which took as its focus the subject of anti-racism in animation and the way we might think about broadening our animation syllabi and questions of curriculum design. Uh, we were thrilled with the suggestions we received across multiple platforms, uh, and as a result, we were truly uh, sport for choice. But the outcome, I'm pleased to say, um, is that we're going to be doing, and this is on the recommendation of Iris R. Um, you'll hear the other recommendations and suggestions later in the show, but Iris, if you're listening, this one is quite literally for you. Uh, we're going to be doing the 2007 autobiographical animated feature Persepolis, directed by Marjan Satrapi, um, or co-directed by Satrapi and Vincent Parnot, and based on Satrapi's earlier comic book series published in the early 2000s. Um, now, this was a film I had the pleasure of seeing before, um, but Alex, am I right in thinking that you were new to Persepolis? Oh yes, new to Persepolis, still digesting Persepolis, watched it yesterday, um, enjoyed it, um, but I'm, I feel I'm, I'm tapping into about 10% of it at the moment, so I'm excited to, to work my way through it over the rest of the podcast. I think this is going to be one of those transformative episodes where I work out what I think about it by about the 55 minute mark, so, so listeners, buckle up and um, hope you enjoy the ride. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, for me, as I said, it was a film that I'd, I'd seen before. Um, I was lucky enough recently to write a short piece for a website that looked at its relationship to another animated film that deals with conflict in the Middle East, Waltz with Bashir, which is obviously a film we've spoken about on the podcast before. Um, and equally, I think during the course of the episode, we might be able to make some nice comparisons um, between the way or the way that sort of, you know, history and, and um, social change and, and culture is represented in Waltz with Bashir and, and Persepolis. Um, for me, it's it's uh, a film that immediately, when I've taught animation before, um, you know, we're thinking about representations of uh, history, national identity, um, uh, and also animated documentary. I don't think the film is quite an animated documentary, um, but I would be interested to perhaps have a play with some of the critical frameworks that circulate around animated documentary uh, and then apply them to something like Persepolis, which is sort of, you know, it, it's quasi-animated documentary. It also is autobiography. Um, and so I'd be interested to have a little uh, play with, with some of the categories um, and also to think about animated space. I think the visual style of the film uh, is wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it would, would fit quite nicely in the broader discussion of sort of animation's ability to uh, represent the past, um, issues of kind of catharsis and subjectivity. So, yeah, I think with my animation hat on, hopefully I've got uh, mm. a few things to say. With your fantasy hat on, where are we, where are we placing Persepolis? Can we place Persepolis? Where should we place Persepolis? Yeah, it's, it's interesting you made the Waltz with Bashir um, comparison, because I sort of think I was thinking that way in mind before we started recording anyway, in the sense that I think this is definitely one of those episodes where I'm not claiming this to be a fantasy film, whatever you know that word means, and we... I, you know, the more we do these episodes, the more I'm not really sure, but um, it's, you know, it's certainly not part of a genre of fantasy. I don't think it fits many fantasy storytelling modes. Um, and, but, but, but there are places and spaces and, and ideas in the movie that are very fantastical and, and it's certainly, the film's very imaginative yeah. um, and quite overtly so. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are things to talk about in, in terms of, um, what what this episode will dramatise or, or or help help us speak to perhaps is is the thorny relationship 
fantasy um, filmmaking, fantasy storytelling as a genre, you know, as a popular genre b- given birth to by Western um, ideas and Western culture uh, has with the depiction of the Middle East and the depiction of, of you know, uh, Middle East culture, Persian culture, Islamic culture. Um, and there's there's lots of work on this, but, you know, um, from the, the, the di- there's a difficulty in articulating um, that part of the world's um, imaginative collective uh, because of lots of different historical reasons, um, but mainly to do with Western imperialism because most um, entrenched problems uh, usually can be rooted back to that. So I'm excited to explore the place of fantasy in the movie and what that mo- and, and maybe the difficulty I'm having in finding that place nice and firmly speaks to a larger problem, which is the difficulty of talking about the kinds of structures, the kinds of ideas that we often riff on on this podcast in the context of this specific story um, rooted in this specific culture. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's an interesting, I think, f- film, if we're thinking about animation medium's ability to, and its expressive potential, I think, to work through and provide access to a kind of historical truth that certainly from the where we sit and, and where we are at the moment, it seems to be unobtainable. You know, animation seems to be able in this film to be able to bear the weight of a certain kind of social reality Um uh, and it's obviously because of its historical truth anchored to, to memories of national trauma, um, animation's representation to then memory, uh, um, relationships, sorry, to, to memory. Um, and whether a film like Persepolis and Waltz of Bashir, you know, what is their potential for arousing perhaps or stimulating certain kinds of debate around exactly the kinds of complex representations of um, Palestinian or Arab culture that you are that you're speaking about so you know that it's it's a broader question of representation i think but um, mm-hmm. one that fractures into lots of different um avenues that i'll be happy to, to happy to take a wander down with you over the next hour or so um so well let's wander then shall we wander, yeah let's begin let's begin at the beginning now my first note i've just written mm-hmm. partner to walks with bashir now obviously this is an obvious <laughs> one but i think i just wanted to kind of flag up that um you know the, the film itself was released in in um uh yeah 2000 and uh 2007 and it's and it's sort of partners with Walter Bashir insofar as these are two movies that fall under the guise of perhaps this idea of animated documentary um both of which place front and center this representation of conflict in in the Middle East um and so it, it immediately I think sets up and hopefully some of the things that we talked about with regards to Walter Bashir um in terms of animation's uh, mediatory function I think will, will, will be reflected in the discussions that we're going to have but um I wanted to kind of get the Walter Bashir connection out out in the open um not done and dusted but certainly out there as a, and also I think the the style of the film, the the, the film, the two films are quite um, uh, striking in the way that they then articulate historical reality. So um, yeah, immediately we've got this partner's walk with Bashir. But my second note is Paris Airport, and I put comic book style question mark. So um, yeah, I think the the the, the design of Persepolis. So um, there are kind of two re- from what I can gather, there are two registers in the film. Uh, and actually, more broadly, I think the film is about it's about telling stories. So the, the film starts at the pa- uh, Paris Orly um, in France, where Satrapi herself, so the, the co-director and, and author of these comic books that were released in the early 2000s, it's actually an adaptation of two comic books. Um, she is uh, at uh, what looks like you can't aren't quite sure whether it is a departure lounge, whether she's. Um, arrived, but then she she looks at a, a, a listing board of, of various um, destinations and looks at Tehran, and then from there the whole film becomes a kind of reflection on Margie as she goes by um, her history, so her migration, her beginnings, sort of thing, um, set against the backdrop of the Iranian Revolution, and then her various movements in and out of the Middle East, um, her kind of ascension to adulthood, her rebelliousness, her relationship to national identity. Um, lots and the kind of peaks and troughs of her of her life, um, and so ostensibly, I think the movie is about yeah, it's about memory uh, and kind of subjectivity. Yeah, I think, um, and in terms of what you're saying there, it's it's also playing out against this backdrop of a sort of globalized popular culture, and I think this is where I'm sort of playing with the movie in terms of where I come from these things in that, you know, in the sort of opening credits, you've got this sort of rock and roll esque soundtrack fused with these sort of really beautiful ornate images that um at least um you know from our from my perspective gives off a sort of you know 
um, you know, Arabic uh, architectural design, animate, gra- um, you know, traditional Arabic graphic culture design, and it's this fusion of, you know, um, you know, US uh, dominated popular culture and the, the particularities of Iran, and and the sort of both the 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 um, collaborative, but also the conflict um, dynamic between those two things. In that sometimes in the movie. Um, her ability to see beyond the particulars of her own culture is a really important progressive device and mm. sometimes the source of sort of tension and friction. And I think the film does a very good job there um, at playing with that through its sort of evocation of, of, of you know, of a, of a world beyond Iran through fantasy. And I think it's interesting you've used the word truth a couple of times. I think the film is, is very personal but I'm not sure how how if I would use the word true in the sense that you know if if you know it, it feels very subjective. It feels very we are we are within um, the imagination of our protagonists. You yeah. know, told by the director through voiceover throughout, um, and the space, the time, the feel of the movie is cloaked within this sort of self conscious subjectivity that I think gives the film a very um, yeah, it, it it it's not it's not a photographic, it's not a material, it's not capturing um, something objective in the world. But what it is truthful about is her thoughts, feelings, emotions, and those seem to be privileged throughout in the soundscape, in the visuals, in the graphic design, through the way it uses animation. No, I I agree, and 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 maybe the 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 ambiguity of the idea of truth is something that we can test out when we when we perhaps ally the film to these broader critical frames or these kind of paradigms that have circulated around animated documentary. Because I think quite bigger questions of mimesis and evocation and subjectivity. Um, you know, there, there's one particular scene that that where Margie is diagnosed with depression. That I think encapsulates exactly mm. how um, how and, and and how powerful the animation can can kind of be. Um, but just to kind of yeah, journey back this idea of subjectivity. Yeah. The film, you're right that it reflexively sets up um, the fact that the this is a story that is being told, and this is something that kind of repeats um, with a nice sort of regularity and with a nice rhythm throughout the film. So ostensibly. Um, the story is being told from Margie's perspective. So the, the the glimpse of the word Tehran on on the airport board sort of takes her back and therefore takes us through, um, you know, as I said, from the Iranian Revolution to her being a, um, a student um, in Vienna at one point, uh, and then her relationship with her family, um, and then uh, you know her, her migration to to Paris and then back again and and, and so forth. Um, but it kind of sets up, up as her perspective, and then this, as I said, it kind of repeats, and the whole film is actually seems to be a series of stories or or tales that are passed along. And I suppose it reminded me of the kinds of things that you've spoken to me about. Um, in terms of like you know uh, folkloric traditions and and oral storytelling and things tales that are passed along because there's lots of people that come in and out of Margie's life um, whether it's her uncle Anoush uh, or her um, teachers or love interests that kind of come in and out uh, and a lot of her relationships with other people are based on storytelling. So um, tell them, tell me about your experience um, on the run, Anoush. Tell me about your experience in jail. Um, Tell me about this. And so that's sort of the idea of storytelling, I think, is repeated and also one that is reflected in the visual style. I, w- I would hate to think that when we talk about Persepolis in its, quote, comic book style, that we sort of make a blanket claim about about the style. You know, we've done Spider-Verse in a previous episode and talked about its visual register and its visual crunch and all these sorts of things. But the film, you know, is very deft in the way that it handles different time periods. And actually, I think tempted as we are to perhaps see the film as black and white, quite literally, because the film is largely in a, in a black and white chiaroscuro style. Um, the framing story, so the present is colour, i.e. It, there are there are accents of colour um, within the framing story that allow us to talk about it as a sort of contemporaneous period. Um, then the past is, large, is, is black and white. But within that muted grayscale, if you like. There are gradations, so it's not just black and white the whole way through. The way that the film plays with black as an emphasis or white as an emphasis um, is really interesting. I don't think, you know, it's not just black and white. There are ways in which um, black and white are being used as colours in in a, in a broader sense. They're not about the absence or stripping away or the diluting of detail. I think they actually give a lot 
to the stories that are being told. Um, so I quite liked the, the, the way that black and white are being used to bounce off of each other. And certain scenes are a lot darker and certain scenes are a lot lighter. Um, so black and white doesn't perhaps tell the full um, story. Yeah, and I, and I and I guess I you know I don't I don't think I kn- know with sufficient nuance or sophistication what a comic book style yeah. is. You know, I know I know what we mean, and I think listeners will know what we mean if they've seen the movie or are familiar with you know its poster and its images. It's got you know thick black lines, a certain minimalist um, drawn quality. It, you know, it looks like pages in a, in a book. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have the the sort of um, uh, you know, complex industrialized version of animation that the, the, the sort of, you know, the the, the traditions of, of Western animation certainly within Hollywood have riffed on. Yeah. Um, so I get that, but I guess you know, as someone that doesn't really read comic books, um, I'm sure there are lots of different comic book styles, right? So um, and and it's it, it's interesting that this is the style that's employed here. I haven't really had enough time to process exactly what, when different styles are used and when they're not certainly yeah. there are um you know there are moments that seem to be at least hinting towards a mimetic kind of quality and then there are moments for example like there's this whole subplot involving um you know her sort of childhood belief that she might be a prophet and uh her like you know there's lots of sort of dream-esque sequences where she has a conversation with god um and those seem to be very sort of you know slightly softer slightly more sort of expressive so i can see that the film is definitely riffing on different styles but yeah what and with what purpose eludes me at this present time well let's let's turn let i think this is where animated doctrine might might help um okay and, and actually there's you know i think when we impose um uh, critical frameworks onto to artwork like this um, and this is something that actually is going to come out in what I'm about to say uh, it's not that we're just imposing these frameworks onto our work actually I think uh, and this is Bella Honus, Honus Rowe who obviously was our guest for the Water of the Share episode her book animated documentary sort of proposes categories um, that can be used in animated documentary or certainly used in our criticisms and our scholarly engagement with animated documentary. Uh, and three categories are mimetic substitution, non-mimetic substitution and evocation. Uh, and Honus Rowe says, you know, that these categories aren't just sort of categories for categories sake. Actually, they might help us distill some of the ways in which animation um, and the documentary overlap the role of animation um, and the role, I guess, in in the, in a lot of her cases, the role of live action. In this case, Persepolis is is entirely animated. But um, these three categories. So the categories themselves are in response more broadly to the limitations or perhaps even absence of live action material. So mimetic substitution, where animation offers us knowledge of something that we could all have seen. Um, knowledge that is out there in the shared historical world to which we have all accessed equally, or we could have all accessed equally if we were eyewitness to it. Oh, so if we give an example of that from the movie to help me understand this. So something like, you know, scenes where she's in the marketplace, stuff like that, where yeah. there's a nominal representation of something in the world. Yeah, and I think it's sort of perhaps a, a mimetic substitution is has a close relationship with um, a kind of national or cultural Im- or social imaginary. So um, right. the Middle East is what we collectively believe it to be, which is obviously a very dangerous view to take in the way that in the representation of the Orient historically have been particularly troubled and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. A particular kind of erotic, exotic framing of um, the a Far East that is over there as opposed to us who are who is the centre. Um, and and, so, and I think Paul's just to add a note on that. That's a, I mean, now's the time just to quickly mention it. That's a huge thing within the history of Western fantasy fiction in particular, what um, David Butler calls the sort of Arabian Nights subgenre of popular Western fantasy filmmaking which is this almost using um the orient in we you know with, it, with very thick quotation marks as mm. a sort of playground for western um imaginations and western fantasies you know from the thief of baghdad to aladdin to the harry and sinbad movies to all that kind of stuff you know it's 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 embedded within popular western 
fantasy animation. So that's just a thing to uh, fantasy, yeah, fantasy animation and fantasy fiction live action. So that's a thing to flag up at that point um, and something to, to think about as we look at Persepolis. Which presumably, you know, your citation of Butler there presumably taps into, you know, I'm sure that Butler cites this himself, but, uh, you know, taps into these broader sort of Orientalist discourses, yeah. uh, Said's writing on Orientalism, the sort of core periphery model that takes... Yeah, it takes the West as the as the centre, and then everything else the rest. And so there's a a particular kind of Orientalist framing. Um, I don't know whether this film uh, Persepolis n- navigates around that or circumvents that. Um, given the well, sub- I'm trying to work that out too, in the sense yeah. that I I think the film by playing because the film is very interested in Western popular culture. You know, it, you know, music in particular is a big thing. It's interested in, you know, um, her, you know, her love of bands like Iron Maiden and stuff like that. So the idea that this film isn't interested in American pop culture is is not is not doesn't fit well with me. But I am thinking. I, I think a useful. We're throwing out lots of different sort of subcategories and taxonomies. <laughs> But a thing I'm thinking about, and I haven't got an answer for, as we go back to Bella's uh, <laughs> categories, is is something that um, um, a theorist, uh, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, um, whose recent book, uh, The Dark Fantastic, is a really interesting, um, sets up a really interesting distinction between what she calls the dark fantastic and the black fantastic. And it's important that she's um, writing from an African-American heritage herself. She's writing really about sort of um, the problem of African-American identity and its relationship to popular fantasy fiction. So this isn't quite, this isn't a neat fit onto what we're talking about. There's a cultural distinction to make. But the point she makes, which is quite nice, I think, is that the black fantastic is um, a series of storytellers interested in speculative fiction trying to tell the black experience. Um, and there's a whole history of, you know, African folklore, Afrofuturism, things like that, that are sort of, you know, um, storytellers, right back to someone like um, W.B. Um, du Bois, sort of reclaiming African heritage by reclaiming the African imaginary. And that's what she defines as sort of the black fantastic. And then the dark fantastic, which is what her book is about, is this sort of... Um, the, the, the consequence of Western culture projecting their imagination onto, um, you know, a, a an African-American population, Africa itself, an Orient, all this kind of stuff. So she's interested in how popular Western fantasy creates a, a vision or a way of fantasizing about race that is actually very difficult, no matter where you come from, to get out of. So she's interested in, you know, the way, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, char- you know th- things like the Lord of the Rings often code um, Orientalism within their description of orc culture. Uh, yeah. The way uh, films are very, you know, we- well, popular fantasy fiction is very white. You know, it's, it's extremely white. The statistics are something like ninety eight percent of protagonists in Western fantasy stories are are white, um, and uh, you know that's problematic, obviously. So I think I'm interested in how this film is exploring, you know, what we might call a black fantastic or an Arab fantastic, a fantastic that is rooted in Arab culture, rooted in the Arab imaginary, rooted in what it means to be living in Iran and dreaming and a sort of Western dream of Iran that is encoded within loads and loads of different fantasy literature. And I can't help feeling the film is riffing somehow on both by telling this story about a young girl who on one hand is deeply Iranian, on the other hand, finds that identity problematic. Yeah, and, and, and you know, has that's where the, the perhaps ending of the film has its power. You know, she admits where, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. where she's from. But um, it's interesting then, that, and we will get to Bella's second category. <laughs> I'm loving this so far, um, because and, and perhaps this is exactly why categories like this are useful, because they immediately give you something to butt your head against. But um, mm. The, the and I wonder with with regards to what you're saying, the importance of kind of subjectivity and perspective um, is that the the fact that we know uh, quite explicitly that this is from her perspective means that immediately the narrative becomes kind of decentered or it, it's it's not. Um, you know, some of the criticisms of a film like Argo, for example, are that it's sure. a very one-sided, you know, it's a perspective, it's an us and them, as I said before, a core periphery look at Middle Eastern culture. And isn't it isn't it exotic and erotic and other and strange and needs, um, you know, and we're doing our kind of white colonial imperial archaeological function because we're resuscitating a dead 
um, a dead culture and bringing it to you. This one, this film, Persepolis, sort of does it the other way around. So you have you have her subjectivity as the framing device. You have her experience of the Iranian Revolution, and then what we see of Western culture is is it's interesting to see what the film presents to us and what makes it across to her. So as you say, it's Iron Maiden, it's the Bee Gees, it's ABBA, mm. it's Michael Jackson, it's things that are, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess, and you said about the music, it, it is interesting the kinds, of, the ways in which the, the, the West in this film seems to adopt some of the qualities that Orientalist discourse was, would historically attribute to the Orient, i.e. Um, look at this, um, uh, yeah, kind of exotic, decorative, presentation of the west it's the west That's really interesting i hadn't thought about that but you're absolutely right the film frames pop culture at least in certain degree as a sort of imagined orient spectacular yeah. other for yeah. the protagonist to project onto her imagination and that's really really interesting because that's exactly trying to confront the problem i'm trying to work through which is that this idea of of usually it's the other way around, creates uh, what Elizabeth Thomas refers to as an imagination gap in different sort of racial cultures. So mm. some some culture, you know, an African-American growing up in states where you're surrounded by popular white fantasy fiction, you're almost taught that to imagine is to be white and to be black is to be, is to, is to keep one's feet on the ground. Um, mm. You know, she writes personal sort of biographical information of her father almost doing that thing we were talking that, you know, characters do in, in often fairy tales where they tell their young kids not to dream because a dreaming is a white person's uh, occupation. Yeah. And what this film does is it reframes dreaming as part of what it means to be Iranian, but it uses the West not as a, a reality, but as a, as a, as a site through which um, the imagination can be let loose. Um, yeah, that's really that, interesting. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and it's interesting now thinking back to when we see that reference as a, a reference in a schoolroom. Um, I think it's in the classroom where the, the uh, Margie and her schoolmates are talking about the Bee Gees versus Ab and she pulls out a, a record and then uh, her friend pulls out a record and they're, sh they're kind of comparing the two bands. And it's at the time the teacher is talking about the veil um, and the, the teacher is talking about the veil, but the power of the veil and actually trying to suggest that the veil is actually um, a tool for liberation. That mm. um, we should, we, you know, women should wear the veil. So the teacher is the kind of surrogate for this, um, yeah, this kind of, you know, totalitarian regime and so forth. But it is interesting that that conversation between the two, on the one hand, narrative level, the conversation between the school children, between um, debating the merits of the Bee Gees and ABBA, which is something that, you know, Sophie's choice, but um, the comparison. Well, yeah, that's another fantasy slash animation slash BG slash ABBA. This is another conversation. Right. Um, I'm torn. I'm torn. There we go. Um, but uh, I think it's interesting that the discussion about the merits of the two um, on a narrative level is played out as a moment of disruption, i.e., that they shouldn't be talking about these things in a classroom. Um, but it's equally significant that the conversation that's being had. Uh, is about is about the veil and things that are being hidden and uh, veiled and and so forth. But it's the it, it, what makes it through, and it's treated as this covert thing. There's a the sequence I think um, later on where Margie's walking through um, essentially a black market, and you have these spiv-like characters who are selling her um, trainers and uh, a jacket and CDs, and they're they're under the cover of the of their jackets themselves and so the, the west is treated as you say is this imagined it's an it's an equally as imagined but i agree that it's not it's a sight for us to think through precisely these kinds of debates around orientalism but um anyway we, we've only done one of the categories so there we go um, oh yeah sorry so this is this is bella honus rose categories yes yes so that was mimetic substitution the idea that you know that we have a shared historical imaginary we could have had access to it so i think yeah the the oh. If so, we can do twenty minutes on the other two categories, we can go home, Chris. Well, let's let's <laughs> let's see. Uh, okay, number two um, is not, and I should say that these are all within the context of animated documentary. I don't think we're necessarily claiming for the film to be animated documentary, but it certainly raises questions about the film's connection to animated documentary and the relevance of these kinds of frameworks to other kinds of text. So the second category is non-mimetic substitution. So animation, as Bella says, begins to add something, to suggest things through style 
and tone. So this might be where footage was unavailable. So one of the very first animated documentaries, um, the sinking of the, if not the first, the sinking of the Lusitania, um, footage of the boat sinking is not available. The animation does the job of live action. So animation begins to add something to suggest things through its style and tone and perhaps to compensate for the absence of filmed material. So now we're starting to get more towards animation's kind of creative potential. Um, mm. So I, there are there are certain scenes, I think, in the film, um, perhaps her experiences to with regards to music, her experiences of the war, perhaps, um, the backdrop, the stories that she is being told, because let's not forget, within this film, Satrapi is also, in that, so we have like layers of, we have, the whole film is her memory, and then within the film itself, she is told stories by her uncle, by friends of the family, um, so she then imagines, so you have a kind of secondary layer, and what's interesting about those layers is that they're animated in a different way, and they're animated like puppet theatre. Um, oh yeah, okay. So there are moments where um, so, for example, her father is telling her the story of the shark quite early on, and then the tone or the start of the film shifts, and it's a kind of thea uh, theatre style, um, a pu and by puppet aesthetic, I mean, you can see the movements of the characters are designed to be sort of hinged and to have these kinds of articulation points. Um, and so suddenly the tabula um, quality of the comic book style, this quote-unquote comic book style, the use of kind of frames and panels suddenly gives way to something that's very obviously staged. And so when Marge is hearing these stories, the, the, uh, the style of the film, visual style of the film shifts and it becomes this sort of puppet aesthetic. And so that for me is her hearing this story and then imagining it as, as she was being told it and she's kind of filling in the details. She wasn't there. So she's using herself, non-memetic substitution, to 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 articulate her, her own processing of the story that she's being told. Yeah, it's interesting that you say puppet. I I I've written in my notes a lot of this looks like a picture book. Oh. Um, and I was thinking about sort of you know hinges and frames as part of a sort of you know the the the, the you know the, the mechanics of a picture book. And it yeah. made me think a lot. And I, as I, I'm, I keep wanting to caveat this because I'm having just sort of you know, explore the difficulty of, of assigning Western fantasy tropes to, to this text. Um, I'm, I'm now going to do it. Um, but um, it made me think of like, you know, the nonsense sort of poetry of Edward Lear or Lewis Carroll and these sort of um, stories that are were always accompanied by these beautiful pictorial images mm. um, and have been written about sort of, um, I mean, uh, Eric Rabkin talks about this, the, the anim that fantasy, when it was conceived of in the Victorian era or, or conceived of in the sort of Enlightenment era, was its powers, was it's in its revelation of perspective. But I think we perhaps, or the film, in dialogue with this film, we could perhaps critique that notion that, yes, it does, but quite often that perspective is white and male and cisgendered and straight. Yeah. So it's interesting that this movie uses a very... To you know, in, in my mind, a, a very sort of recognizable iconography associated with a fantasy literature that is imaginative and, and perspective revealing, but belonging to an incredibly um, imperialist uh, world, you know, mm -hmm. and, and reframing that as a, as a way of, of, of speaking to the gaps in this character's knowledge. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, and I'd, I suppose I'd also add to that the sequences. Um, where she talks to God. Um, yeah, hmm. you know, God, God is is obviously certainly in the film is this sort of um, uh, symbol or uh, manifest. Well, I say in this film, but you know, more this sort of kind of connoting comfort and security. Um, let's not forget that a lot of the film she spends certainly for the first half an hour, if not more. I didn't note it down. You know, she spends as a child. Um, and so it makes perfect sense, this, this, the picture book reference that you mentioned there, that it makes perfect sense that her reference points, um, given that she's an adult thinking about the story, you know, yeah. it, makes me, it makes me think that stuff like the Bee Gees and, and ABBA were, were examples of things that came through, but the, those are the things that she remembers. And so her memory of that, her relationship to the West is distilled down into these kinds of symbols. Um, but in the case of God, I wonder whether... Um, her relationship to this kind of godlike character who talks to her and provides her comfort is is yeah it, it's an example of this non-memetic substitution it's it's animation's obviously beginning to add something and it's suggesting through 
it's uh, as Bella says, it's style and tone, a kind of relationship that didn't happen in the way that it it is being presented. Um, I don't know. I haven't quite kind of thought it through because I've been thinking about the the diffuseness between the the second two categ- uh, the the categories two and three. Um, so that, that leads me on to the yeah. third category, which is evocation. So this is perhaps the other extreme. So where the shift, and this is um, Honus Road discussing. Uh, the category of evocation in her book on animated documentary, where the shift from the observable is furthered. And through the use of animation, we can see documentary's ability and suitability to represent the world of personal experience. Um, Animation becomes a tool to explore and reveal hidden or forgotten paths, demonstrating the medium's capacity for documenting the world from a subjective point of view. So it seems like that the whole film could be considered an example of evocation because it's it's her subjective point of view. Yeah. Um, but I would argue that within that, we've obviously got examples of mimetic substitution. We've obviously got examples of non-mimetic substitution. I think for me, the biggest example of evocation is the is the the sequence that I mentioned at the start, the um, the sort of depression and ultimately, spoiler alert, her her attempted suicide. Um, mm. so this is. Um, after so she's moved she, she's had her childhood in the um uh, iran against the backdrop of the iran and iraq war um she then moves to vienna where she becomes a student um she lives with nuns um she develops um bronchitis she has a couple of romantic relationships um uh spends the days on on her park bench and she becomes very kind of reflective uh, and then she is diagnosed with clinical depression and then tries to commit commit suicide. And for me, this is the moment where we we we've got a shift into the category of evocation because I, I don't know if you remember she gets diagnosed with depression and then you have this this black screen with drawings of falling bottles and pills mm. that are designed as a sort of shorthand to articulate you know her mental state, but also the facts of the matter that this is, you know, we're moving towards an attempted suicide. And then my favourite bit in the film is that the character herself turns into a white outline against the black background. So she's essentially hollowed out, becomes, and actually it's quite provocative because, you know, the, the, it looks like a chalk outline. Uh, and then she, then we have a scene which is her talking to God and she says, and God says something like, what are you doing here? And she says, well, I'm, I'm dead. Um and so uh, there's lots of different shifts between, I think, all three of these categories in the film. Yes, the whole film is about her subjectivity and her point of view and her personal experience of this um, uh, revolution. But actually, I do think that the film moves between these three categories and, and thinking about when and where and how it does uh, perhaps allows us to think more about the, 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 the not the uneven, I mean, the unevenness in a good way, the unevenness within the film's visual style. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know what you think of that kind of evocation. Yeah. Is, well, is well, there a film like this, or what, what do we think? Yeah, no, I, I, I would be inclined to agree. I think to go back to the quote on, from Rabkin, you know, if, if, if what fantasy does, and in this case what animation does by evoking it, is reveals the presence of perspective, um, then this film reveals the presence of perspective through its visual style, for its choice to be... An animation. I remember you once saying on the podcast, maybe you said it a couple of times, that you know to draw something is inherently to comment on it and reflect upon it. Yeah. Um, and so this is a life that is drawn on screen for us. And so there is this. You know, I, I completely agree that the film pertains to to truth and to mimesis and to things that happened in the world. But by but through its style, through its choice of medium, um, and then through stylistic choices it makes along the way. It continually asks the viewer, or at least it asked me, to um, to to reflect upon the distance between, you know, the objective truth in the world and and mm. and the character being told it. Not not to critique what she's saying, but to celebrate it, to see this as a story about storytelling, to see this as a story about someone's perspective, nuanced, complicated, contradictory, difficult, um, fascinating perspective. On her own life, um, so it's not a story. It's not a you know. It's not a biopic. It's not a documentary. It's a it's a it's a, a story of a life told by someone who's reached a, a particular perspective on her life. Um, and so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think the film does flip between some of these different um, representational strategies, some of these um, different animation strategies. Um, 
and it's and actually, and it continually plays with this notion of I am showing you something. I'm you know that I'm one step removed from what I'm showing you. Well, it's it's yeah, it's it's using you know I, I'm going to show you so that I can tell you. Um, but the the yeah. the point that you made about the kind of contradictory. You know, it's a perspective that is contradictory, that is uh, complicated. It's, you know, it's imagined in the broader sense um, is obviously, is, you know, and we've talked about this previously, that it's, it's obviously well served by animation as a kind of creative medium, which in whatever guise the, the, the style takes. Um, and there's there's an article by Eilish Wood called, you know, from about, in fact, I think it's 2007. So around the time that the film was released, coincidentally, though it's not one of the case studies that Wood refers to. It's an article called Reanimating Space and talks about um, animation's capacity to, uh, quote, reinvigorate how we think about space, cinematic space. Um, and one of the things we often overlooked, overlook when we think about space, um, Wood says, is that a kind of space associated with an expression of intensive spatial experience and other kinds of transformation. We live through and in space, generating intensive experiences through memories and active imagination or transforming through actual activities, which I think nicely encapsulates what the film is about. We kind of catch the space or the animated space of Persepolis in the act of changing. And the reason we catch it in the act of changing is because her memory is, is flitting between that thing that she, that ABBA record that she remembered and that moment where she walked in on her, her boyfriend at the time watching The Terminator and thinking, oh yeah, I remember that, because I remember that's when I left him. Um, and all these different moments that, that are, and goes back to what we said about the decorative portrayal of the West. Um, the way that historically we think about Orientalism is being nicely inverted here because we get a very decorative, imagined idea of the West. Um, and it allows then the film to take on exactly Margie's experience and the way that she, quote, lives through and in space. Um, and so mm. it's, it's not just that animation as a medium is well suited because it is creative. It's OK. So in the in the way that we engage with space day to day, space is constantly changing. People move past us. Space develops. It transforms. We live through it. Um, space allows us to generate these memories and experiences. And um, you mentioned right at the beginning the word imagination, you know, that you were thinking about imagination. And I think maybe that's that's it. It's it's fantasy slash imagination. Um, well, psych psychoanalytic theories of fantasy make this point about space. Um, it's something I've riffed on in, in work that's yet to be published. But if you're listening in the future in 2021, 2022, you can find it in my book. Um, if for those not, that's a teaser to the future that hopefully we'll, we will reach. Um, but, but back to the podcast um, uh, after the shameless plug um, is this... Um, that, that, that basically, you know, we actually develop an, a fantastical relationship with space before we develop um, a rational relationship with space. You know, as children, um, we don't um, we don't understand space as a connection of objective relationships. We don't understand the space in our house as a set of rooms that can be mapped. Um, we understand space in terms of its emotional value. You know, we understand the bathroom as the place where our parents make us bathe and we don't like it or where we have to potty train and we don't, you know, so it's a scary space. We understand our bedrooms as a space of, of, of comfort. You know, we have an, we imagine things onto space and that's the meaning we take from it before we start working, worrying about it rationally, objectively, we don't have that ability yet. So to, to, so what fantasy fiction can often do, and it sounds like what animation can do, surprise, surprise, <laughs> is, is re reassert that imagined quality of space, that space is not um, an objective thing. It's a subjective state. Um, to draw space, um, to evoke space through drawing, is to draw something that is inherently dreamed up. And I think mm. you said she shows us so that she can tell us. Yeah, I would say she almost she imagines something that so she can explain something. Um, mm. The story imagines something new into being. The, the film imagines something new into being to explain something that has already happened in the world. Okay, I'm just going to pause the uh, conversation we're having uh, there, Chris, because as teased at the beginning of the podcast, um, we would like to just briefly mention some of the, um, could have won, some of the suggestions for uh, animations, fantasies, based on the idea of 
um, diversity and inclusion that you kindly suggested over the internet that we'd like to just briefly share with you all. Absolutely. We've, uh, we wanted to go through some honourable mentions and actually the range of stuff that we've got from Warner Brothers shorts of the 1930s and 40s right up to uh, kind of contemporary West African folk tales is really diverse. So we're really grateful for all the suggestions. And um, yeah, this is our chance to kind of uh, talk a little bit about those and, and perhaps offer our own um, reasons as to why uh, listeners might want to go off and, and, and watch the films for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, we'll, we'll start with um, a suggestion from our website. Um, this is Iris R, who um, thankfully gave us, the, gave us the suggestion to do Persepolis. Um, but she also suggested a few other films that I'm not that familiar with, Chris. I'm not sure if you are. Um, she suggested that we could look at um, Kirikou and the Sorceress, which I believe is a Michelle Ocelot movie. Yep. Um, the Rabbi's Cat um, as well. Um, and she also um, said some kind words about the um, anti-racist um, animation syllabus that we published recently on our website. Um, so thanks, Iris. Um, Ocelot, Kirikou and the Sorceress. What's what's that all about, Chris? Well, so Kirikou and the... the I mean, a lot of these were, were films that, regrettably, I weren't that familiar with. Um, this, yeah, is, okay. this is... Um, yeah, I mean, Ocelot himself is a figure uh, that I would imagine that in the future we'll, we'll kind of turn to. Uh, French writer, mm-hmm. um, designer, storyboard artist, um, written and, and directed a, a number of films. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the film itself, Kirikou, uh, it's a West African folktale, um, I think raises lots of bigger questions about the representation of non-white identity. Um, so thank you very much to, to both uh, Iris and Nina for, for recommending it. Uh, and we've got a suggestion from friend of the show, Astrid Goldsmith on Twitter, who um, who offered the idea of doing I Lost My Body. We were very tempted with this, yeah. Astrid. Um, so I Lost My Body is an animated film uh, that won the Grand Prix at Cannes. Um, and as Astrid says on Twitter, um, it's probably the only film with a severed hand as a main character. Cool. And it's pl- and it's the only animated film with a North African protagonist, she thinks. Yeah. Um, she offers some ideas on fantasy and escape in them. Um, again, not a film I've seen. I, I heard it did quite well over the last year or so. Yeah. And it sounds like a really interesting movie. Maybe we should cover someday. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, yeah, it, it would get us into debates around representation of the animated body. I'm just reading here that it was nominated for Best Animated Feature, um, losing to Toy Story 4, which actually is a nice sort of parallel to the film that we've just been discussing. Uh, Persepolis, which was nominated for the the Academy Award in 2007, um, well, actually the 2008 ceremony, I think, but lost to Ratatouille. So there's, um, yeah, there's a sort of uh, Pixar success um, at the Academy Awards is sort of notable, um, but do check out the, the other nominees, the other honourable mentions, and certainly I Lost My Body, which is this sort of strange um, uh, tale of this, as you said, this sort of severed hand, I think is, um, is yeah, is an interesting one that perhaps speaks more broadly to animation's ability to um, uh, fragment and contort the body. We also have uh, a couple of recommendations from uh, Cody Meyer. Their recommendations are a couple of Betty Boop shorts from the 30s and 40s. Now, Bamboo Isle, I was familiar with. Um, I wasn't as familiar with uh, I'll Be Glad When You're Dead. Bamboo Isle is a good one. Uh, I think I've used it in the classroom when talking about uh, racist representation or certainly talking about the historical specificity of certain kinds of studio era cartoons, the way in which they sort of can be used, I think, more broadly in an educational setting to to talk about uh, animations, um, potentially racist past, um, what it means to kind of teach these movies. So Cody's very kindly um, recommended a couple of, of Betty Boop shorts, so a popular Hollywood character of the period um, and sort of positioned the character within these broader sorts of um, uh, racist narratives. So really interesting ones to check out. So thank you, Cody, for those recommendations. Cody submitted that via Facebook. We've also got um, another submission via Facebook from Nina Bradley, who's an adjunct professor at City College's Chicago. Um, Nina also suggests Kirikou and the Sorcerer, so that was a popular one. We must probably cover that sometime, or at least a not a lot movie. Um, Nina suggests that it's a good one for Afrofuturism. We've talked about that on the podcast before when we did Black Panther, but a, a much richer topic than one movie, so perhaps we could revisit that. Um a lovely soundtrack, vibrant colours and a witty hero, one of the first black cast animations. And I show it to my own kids and they love it. Well, that's not, not a terrible reason at all no. whatsoever. So thanks, um, thanks, Nina, for that. Um, uh, and um, nice to hear from you. Finally, last but absolutely not least, we've been very kindly sent an audio file from um, Sarah Wingrove um, via our website. And I'm going to play the audio file now and let Sarah give us her recommendations um, for herself. Hi, I'm Sarah Wingrove, an MA Film Studies graduate of King's College London. So some of my research is on lesbian and bisexual women and the embodiment of queerness through movement in animation, particularly in stop motion. I'd highly recommend checking out B, directed by Kai Stanaka, She-Ra by Noelle Stevenson and Citrus by Takeo Takahashi.
Thanks for your suggestion, Sarah. And I think there are all some interesting ones. Shira is a is a text I really want us to cover at some point, but but shockingly, Chris and I have not seen a second of just yet. So we're we're working on it, Sarah. But but not just we, our schedules wouldn't allow us to cover it for today. Yes, certainly. We've the the, the um, suggestions that we've got have really given us food for thought in terms of where we take fantasy animation, um, as well as pro- providing us with a, a screening program for the next six months. So <laughs> to all of those who got in touch either via the website, um, either via social media, so Facebook, Twitter, for giving us your recommendations on um, potential ways. We can think about diversity and inclusion um, and your suggestions for, for rich case studies to think about those areas. So, listeners, this was fun. We want to keep doing this. We um, enjoyed having your responses. We enjoyed taking part of the conversation with you between episodes, and we want to sort of um, keep this going, basically. So with what we're thinking is that we will keep doing this once a month. So, you know, we release two episodes a month. Um, the first of those episodes will be a listener choice episode, and we're thinking we'll do the same format. We're going to pick a theme now. We invite your suggestions and then we'll share as many as we can on the podcast um, in, in the month's time, as well as pick um, our favourite or, as you've learned from this list, our most accessible and um, uh, one we've probably already seen, but certainly one that we'll think through logistically, but also, you know, and how we can explore some of the ideas um, and, and play with it on the show. So, um, Chris, what theme are we going to cover next time? So, um, for the next podcast, Listener's Choice, uh, we'd love to hear your suggestions for your favourite graphic novel or comic book adaptation. Now, obviously, we're dealing with um, Persepolis at the moment, so uh, which is, as you know, a, an adaptation of um, Sir Trappi's uh, earlier comic books. So this is a chance for us to take something that we're discussing now and really use it as a launch pad to get you involved in the conversation. So your favourite graphic novel or comic book adaptation, give us your suggestions via the website, um, drop us a line, send us an audio file, um, and we'll have a play with your suggestions. Um, you can it's very easy to get in contact um fan and in research is our handle f-a-n-a-n-i-m research you can find that on twitter at fan and in research you can find that on instagram you can find that on reddit you can find that on facebook uh and you can also find it via our shiny new email address fan and in research at gmail.com f-a-n-a-n-i-m research send us a suggestion if you want to send us an audio file like sarah did that would be wonderful can you keep it to 30 seconds or less so we can fit them as many onto the show as possible um send us your suggestion explain why that'd be really handy chris and i will pick our favorite somehow and we will cover it in a month's time on the show but for now please do enjoy the show i mean i, I suppose it speaks to broader you know, broader questions about what animation's relationship to to memory, and you know, these are these are long-standing debates about whether animation. You know, there's no other way to tell this story. I think uh, Ari Folman said that when he was talking about Walter Bashir. You know, that there's no other way to tell animation is the only way that we can tell this this story of real historical events and equally my kind of experience of those kinds of events. Um, but I think this it, it raises these bigger questions, of course, within within animated representation that we've we've asked previously whether animation's formal style uh, dilutes the subject matter. Does it support the power and the weight of this kind of historical subject matter? Does it, um, uh, in the case of uh, Margie's imagination, does it reclaim and save and commit to, 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 to drawing her memory of these kinds of historical um, events and saves them from a kind of cultural amnesia? Uh, does it render them, because it's obviously very, the style is very, um, there are bits that are that veer towards abstract and kind of unorthodox and non-figurative, whether it actually renders um, the historical real uh, incomprehensible and so you know because it does lots of things you know the film mixes past and present you have moments where she shares the screen with her younger self um, and so the prox- proximity between her real life and then I don't know her real life uh, at particular moments in time um, whether we can look past the artificially of artificiality of animation all these kinds of bigger questions and I wonder then whether your point about the imagination helps helps us get to the heart of it that that if i've understood it that she imagines it first and then and then draws it or that the imagination comes first in some way yeah or 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 that what we're watching here is not a a story you know if we were to film if we were to i can you know i i'm always suspicious of it couldn't been told another way because my instinct that well it could have it just been different but um but if we take that 
thing and go, right, so what's the effect of, of the film being told this way? But if you were to, you know, I don't know, I guess you could have done this by filming, um, you know, actors in, in the roles in a sort of, you know, almost conventional biopic manner, even a sort of, you know, something like... Uh, you know, something like Midnight's Children, the adaptation of the Salman Rushdie novel or um, or Slumdog Millionaire, like films that have fantastical elements that are nevertheless filmed. But the quality of filming them means that the space and time as we see on screen would inherently be captured, um, you know, if we accept, you know, some of the... Well, at least we accept the cultural association between photographic imagery and realism, you know, even if we might disagree yeah. that... There's a huge problem with that um, that we're we're seeing as we play out with things like fake news. But you know, you know, culturally we associate the photographic moving image as as a capture, a moment of space and time. So even even if you film these things, although they're fictional, the space, the time is is sort of weighted or grounded in some objectivity. But what we get here is, I think, a, not a you know, not a life told on screen this isn't it's a wonderful life this isn't a story like that this is a, a a story in the present like rooted in the present and it's someone imagining right in the here and now the voiceover to me feels you know immediate and and urgent um it's someone you know here and now imagining and they're imagining about the past that they've lived through yeah well, I, I, I'm just then thinking about memory more broadly mm. and, and the division that we've got here then between, because if we remember when, we, when our discussion of uh, Waltz with Bashir was, was kind of coming to an end, we talked about the final sequence of the sure. film that is live action and what that means, you know, what that means. <laughs> um, and so, I was, you know, I was thinking about the style of Persepolis um, and how it manifests graphically that kind of, I don't know, that individual or even collective national memory yeah. of real events um so the evocation mm -hmm. of memetic substitution um but the memory can be fluid and changeable and unreliable and incoherent um rather than a concrete set of recollections um and so it would seem that it's strike certainly i think persepolis is striking visual style uh, dramatizes because you were dramatizing earlier dra dramatizes a kind of heightened political climate that you know i don't have any personal experience mm. of but I, I what i've got is somebody's subjective experience of that real world event i've got satrapi's broader evocation of a real a series of real events and how they impacted her um you know, and and broader questions about how she feels isolated and forlorn and uh, powerless and under a certain kind of uh, regime at a particular time. And, and often, you know, a lot of the questions that the film raises around nationalism are, you know, these are questions. There's one scene where a statue is removed, you know, and these are all these are all questions. I wonder whether part of the reason that the voiceover feels so present is because the events that it are describing, like like stories that are being told, just repeat, you know, the same kinds of of conversations that we are having around historical veracity and you mentioned fake news and post-truth and all that kind of stuff the heightened political climate that we find ourselves in um is symbolized by the same kinds of moments and icons that the film is dramatizing the power of a, of a statue being being removed and how we consume historical information and i guess i guess by using this sort of comic style because you know you know whatever one does with it comic is a sort of you know very american invention you know, um, it doesn't mean you can't do something very interesting with it outside that tradition. But, you know, it, it, it's if we talked about, um, you know, how it uses, you know, US inflected pop culture, it's using a style um, that is that is rooted within, you know, gl globalized pop culture um, and, and therefore a style that is associated beyond, um, you know, around the world as being, quote unquote, normal. Yeah, uh, which is obviously, you know, one of the most dangerous words in the English language, in any language. <laughs> um, but what it does is it uses that normalcy, that assumed normalcy, and and depicts things that perhaps on perhaps through live action would would inherently, at least to Western audiences, have a certain Orientalist air to it. You know, the sight of a toppling statue, 
in Iran, mm-hmm. given that all the things we've seen on the news over the last sort of 20, 30 years is inherently inflected with this sort of West, you know, it, it to, to, you know, what, what, you know, from a Western audience's perspective, I'm thinking here, whilst by doing it this yeah. way, actually, it feels normal. And it feels sort of part of a register that could be her attending an American high school. And I don't mean that that it feels American. I mean it feels, you know, it, it's cloaked with that, and she's using that as almost like a power device. It's it's the normalcy is reclaimed in a world that that the Western imagination has made spectacular. And I'm thinking of a moment where I, I, I'm a bit sketchy about exactly how the scene plays out, but it was one of my favourite moments in the in the film where um, she's approached by sort of two women in the market. Um, Oh, yeah. And and she has to make up a story as to sort of her home life. And she creates this, you know, almost Dickensian story about, you know, having to like feed her, chil- uh, you know, um, siblings like, you know, the, the moss, you know, the moss off the, fl- it's really sort of, you know, um, hysterically poor. And, and it's the sort of stuff that, to be honest, I find really uncomfortable in films like Slumdog Millionaire, where you've got a sort of um, a white crew depicting Mumbai, um, with these, you know, out, you know, people gouging, gouging each other's eyes out, um, whether it's the reality or not, the things that people choose to focus on. And here, that moment's a really nice sort of microcosm of what's going on, in that you've got this sort of, it's mocking this reality and offering something normal instead, something that we feel comfortable in as a Western audience. Um, not to downplay its, yeah. its specific, cultural specificity, but to make that cultural specificity not feel like something that belongs in an Arabian Nights fantasy movie. Yeah, so the, so the comic book style serves a kind of ideological function. I, mean, I, I don't know too much about I don't know too much about the history of kind of the bon désigné, the the sort of French um, or the Franco Belgian comics sure. from the thirties. But it will be interesting to. I, I, I think what it was is that the first one of the first shots of the movie is is um, Margie looking at us, and you have that kind of the, yeah the tableau style of what looks like panels, and then the film tries to do something a little bit little bit different. And I wondered whether there was a connection between the the you know the the film's visual style and the broader sort of the fact that she is she moves between spaces you know, she's kind of untethered and unmoored and has has trouble well not trouble but she makes up these stories about things um as part of her imagination and as part of the way that the film more broadly tells stories but that she tells somebody at a party that she's from france and then by the end has sort of uh, is able to admit to herself that she's from Iran, but her sort of broader the fact that she's kind of unmoored and she moves between these different these different spaces um and she moves between different kind of states of belief she is um somebody who listens to stories and then she becomes a kind of uh you know female uh, a, re- a rebellious figure and ultimately that's one of the reasons that she's then encouraged to leave the kind of country for good because she doesn't want to be confused with uh, a certain kind of being a certain kind of political dissident so she ends up leaving um, and then the film kind of begins where it or ends where it begins I should say back at the airport and obviously airports are really interesting spaces anyway because they are neither here nor there mm. you know we've all been on holiday and the minute you check in and go and you're in an airport you are now not where you're going but you're also not where you're from mm. because you're in a kind of limbo place and so i think the decision to begin and end the film with a scene at an airport is is kind of significant because it speaks more broadly to her lack, lack of fixity you know that she's trying to stay true to herself but who she is is constantly being changed and so i quite like that as a framing kind of narrative device the role airports in movies there you go yeah, sounds like a sounds like a book. Um, uh, yeah, no, I agree. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but uh, yeah, I, I I concur, and it and it kind of riffs on what we've already said about sort of the reason airports have that quality is not something objective; it's something subjective. It's something imagined on. So yeah. it's still riffing on similar ideas and themes. Um, I guess this is yeah. the moment where we put, we start to wrap up a little bit. Um, what? Yeah. Um, which seems like that went really quickly, and I do think I've got. A better perspective on the movie and what it's doing here, and and um, yeah, great. Um, always nice to, for that to happen. Um, or, or we should keep doing these podcasts, Chris. It might help me. Um, but, um, we, should, we should. I mean, it's good about fifty fifty odd episodes in. You, you, yeah. We, let's just keep doing them. See you in the next. Yeah, episode. sure, sure. Yeah, God, yeah. No, let's let's don't do it like that. Don't dramatize the um the, the fate we've sealed ourselves. Um, 
are there any like you know bits you wanted to flag up things that we haven't talked about yet that hasn't just naturally come up in the conversation uh, I mean, no, I don't think. I mean, the the I suppose there are bigger questions around belief that are folded into the a film itself that is about stories to believe and and the kind of you have the both the political narrative. Um, obviously, I, one thing we haven't really touched on uh, as much, and I don't quite know what to say about it is her relationship with various generations of her family. Mm. Her, I wouldn't say that it's a kind of fractious relationship, but it's it's uneven. But um, yeah, she she. Have, have, she has a relatively stable I think home life she has people that kind of come in and out um and then she obviously has a very kind of close relationship with um her kind of grandmother um and there's a moment towards the end where she visits the graves of her both her grandfather and her uncle which is a, a nice sort of moment of, of reflection um and part of the sort of drama I think of the conclusion is that when she leaves um her family in Iran she knows that she'll never see her grandmother again and that's kind of the way it has to be um and so, yeah, I, I, there's lots more to say about her relationship to her, to her family, and also the kind of other characters that move in and out of her life. So when she stays with nuns, when she, her, yeah, her love interests, I think, um, that kind of group of punks. Mm. Um, and there's one sequence as well that is is when she's singing Eye of the Tiger, which is in English, in English language. Um, I watched the, the subtitled version, but that's one moment in the mm. film which is which is an interesting moment because I think it speaks more broadly to her, the way that the character herself digests Western culture. And that's a very brief sequence where she's singing Eye of the Tiger, which, which might, you know, who knows, it might be the outro song to this podcast, but um, yeah, it's her sort of assuming, I don't know, something, I don't quite, can't quite get my head around that sequence, but um, yeah, I, nothing much to say, but her family, I think is an interesting, you know, her relationship to her parents and her grandparents is perhaps um, nicely offsetting the tyranny of Iranian society that frames Well, them. obviously family members are um, one of the most imagined figures in our lives, you know, I don't mean that they're, well, I therefore, what I mean by that is that they are full of full of fantasy, our relationships with them, they're full yeah. of memory, um, they're full of um emotion they're full of all the things that are subjective rather than objective that's sort of the nature of it so i think the film yeah i think there's loads to say about that i don't think i've got anything succinct to say in 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 30 seconds that's going to help us unpack mm -hmm. that but you're right the way the film um i, I guess it, it, it relates to a thing i wanted to talk about which is that we've talked a lot about like the way it chooses to show things but i think to, a thing to highlight obviously that what this visual style provides is is that it, and what i guess the act of drawing and animation provides is it provides a very nice way of not showing things as well yeah um and the way it skips over certain episodes the way it 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 highlights certain things but um downplays other things there's a moment where she sort of turns from a girl to an adult in a single yeah. mo uh, single sort of visual moment um, and i thought so that was interesting and then also just sort of visually like i find the the, the depiction of war was incredibly minimalist it was sort of this thing that, that, that bubbled up occasionally, but the way it was depicted on screen and the way it was referred to in the narrative m made it um, not, you know, in contrast to something like um, What's With Bashir, it made it sort of really not part of the story. And I think that can't help be a conscious effort in that, you know, it's there, but it's it's the way it's, both the way it's depicted, which is sort of very sort of black, minimal, um, mm. uh opaque and the way it's referred to it, it's it's a side note it's not the story um whilst mm. in the western imagination of course it is the story yeah no, that, yeah that's interesting i think the, the decision to well or, or, or what we choose to focus on what the film chooses to focus on is that part of memory yeah what the film downplays what's being occluded um, what's being rendered invisible, what happens in the background. It's interesting that, yeah, certain things are downplayed, but but the memory of her breaking up with her partner, mm -hmm. you know, she enters at one point into a relationship with a student called Reza, um, and I mentioned that, that there's a sequence where he's sort of not, he's kind of ignoring her and, and she's about to leave and he's watching The Terminator. And that seems like a very strange moment, but that's obviously, that was obviously potent within her memory. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. Um, so that's it. I think that's, that's, we've, we've, well, that's it for this this um, podcast. There's plenty more I think we could say about Persepolis. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you to to Iris for suggesting the film. Uh, if you want to um, read a little bit more about um, the kinds of uh, films that deal with a similar kind of subject matter in terms of uh, representation, you can obviously visit the the website, look at the anti-racist syllabus. Um, 
and yeah, give a keep keep giving us suggestions. Even though I think, even though this, we we've sort of you know looked at this uh, that topic of diversity inclusion. You know, this is the beginning, very much beginning of an ongoing conversation. We've got blog posts coming in the future that deal with this theme kind of more directly. But if you've listened to what we've got to say about Persepolis and uh, disagree with something, or want to focus on a particular sequence, or want to challenge. Um, anything that we've said then yeah i'd, I'd love to to hear because i think it's a film that certainly gets richer and richer in a film that's about telling stories um i'd love to hear more about that. absolutely and you can get in touch um various means you can get in touch uh via twitter at fan anim research f-a-n-a-n-i-m research that's also our handle on facebook uh, on Instagram and on Reddit, so you can contact us there. You can contact us via the website, uh, fantasy-animation.org. Um, there's a Contact Us tab there, and you can fill all that out and, and get in touch. While you're on the website, you can check out, of course, um, blog posts um, that um, that explore different aspects. But Bella Honus Rowe, who we've mentioned on the podcast a couple of times, has written a blog for us on the animated documentary and its relationship to fantasy. Yeah. Um, that'll be in the archive somewhere if you want to have a little look for it. Um, and of course, Bella's been a guest on the show talking about that very same film, um, and you can access that in our podcast um, archive. If you feel like we haven't quite covered something we should cover, um, you, it's it's up to you to fix that. Let let us know and suggest a blog post, and I'm sure we'll be we have to find space to feature it at uh, some point in the near future. So um, get in touch. Um, you can also finally get in touch by our brand spanking new Gmail address. If people have just want to use email, we have an email at fananimresearch. F A N N A I am research at gmail.com uh, where you can contact us directly um, with anything you'd like to say, a comment, a query, a question, um, um, or suggestions for future episodes. Uh, on that note, Chris, I'll let you take that away. Yes. yes. So, um, as we mentioned uh, earlier on, the next listener's choice, uh, what we wanted to do is create kind of connectives between episodes. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we've talked a little bit today about. Um, the relationship that the Persepolis has to graphic novels and, and to the comic book um, format, I think, more mm. broadly. So the next listener's choice will be do get in touch with your favourite graphic novel or comic book adaptation. Are you, a, are you a Catwoman or are you an Iron Man or are you something that we... I've gone unashamedly mainstream, but if there's something that we... Um, you think we should watch there's something that really speaks to fantasy and animation's relationship to the comic book um, get in touch with your favourite graphic novel your favourite comic book adaptation um, and we will endeavour to do it on the podcast all our suggestions are welcome yeah and we will also feature as many as we can um, on that episode which will be in about a month's time so um, please do uh, suggest away um, it's been really fun hearing from you for this episode we hope to continue that on in future episodes um, but for now, I guess I guess that's that's us done, Chris. Okay, well, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I hope that was at least a nice introduction to a very complex and nuanced uh, movie. I certainly learned a lot from the conversation, so hopefully um, you did too. And we will see you next time on the Fantasy Animation Podcast with a different episode and a different guest. Um, but until then, take care and stay safe. Bye.